Welcome back, this is Baller Scoopa with more Let's Play Xenosaga Episode 3, The Story So Far. Xi'an and the others successfully carried out their UMN infiltration mission. The group temporarily disbanded and Doctus set out to analyze the data they obtained. Free for the time being, Xi'an opened the cockpit hatch on the ES Dyna, which revealed a wide blue ocean. Xi'an was on a solitary island on 2nd Milsha, called Pedia Island. Since she quit Vector six months ago, she, has, she had been seeking out their secrets while living a secluded life here. Current objective, relax and take a r walk around the island. I don't think that's exactly what our objective is going to be, but it is nice that they give us a little recap and our objective here at uh, whenever you reload a save. That is nice, but for the time being, we need to strut around in Xion's bikini and go back into the database. We do have quite a bit to read in here, as I'm sure you do remember. This could take up a couple, couple episodes here. All right, so tutorial. Once again, I'm going to try to go through these quickly. Break is so important that it's not just a status effect. It's its own part of the tutorial here, uh, pretty much. Well, actually, this is whole, all new, so I'll just read it. Both party and enemy characters have a break limit. As characters are attacked, break damage is accumulated. When the break gauge reaches 100%, characters fall into break status. Once in break status, the individual suffers from numerous penalties. This makes break status an excellent chance to attack enemies. But, it, but if multiple ally characters fall into break status at the same time, the party is at greater risk of being defeated. It is important to keep an eye on characters' break gauges, especially during long battles. So, uh, once again, uh, they are unable to act for two turns, unable to use boost, unable to evade or guard, unable to perform counterattacks or revenge, and there's a higher risk of receiving critical hits. So, don't let that happen to you. It's going to happen to us. Uh, then we have target control. Enemies have several distinct action patterns, such as attacking the character with the lowest AP, HP, or uh, aiming for break status, the targeted pattern used by an enemy can be determined using the analyze ether as you can see there's there's several patterns you have random which is normal uh, then you have a uh, break killer somebody that is going for uh, somebody's break gauge then you have the healer killer that's my least favorite then you have the HP killer which is typically what you do in an RPG you, you try to kill off the weakest ones first and then you have to use heat in order to take care of that. I believe that is it. That is it for the tutorial. Now it's time to get into the nitty gritty of what is going on. Holy crap, do we have a lot to read today. We're going to start off just alphabetically. Well, not really even alphabetically here. I don't know what order they're going in, but uh, we will go in the order that they give us. First up, we have Albedo Piazzola. I assume it's a TZ. All right. Named after the alchemical process of whitening as put forth in C.G. Young's Psychology and Alchemy, URTV unit number 667 is a variant with milky white hair. So yeah, the name albedo comes from alchemy and then Young used it to describe a certain part of psychology. A being with recuperative abilities that surpasses even nanomachines in rebuilding speed. He is practically immortal. Didn't he die? Like Junior, he is a survivor of the URTV Udu retrovirus force that was artificially created to oppose Udu. He developed a mental instability as a result of Udu waveform contamination during the Milshin conflict and destroyed the URTV force to which he belonged. He killed everybody. Born as conjoined twins with Junior, the two strongly felt like they were a part of each other's body, even after they were separated. His Udu contamination was the result of the collapse of that psychic bond caused when Junior, Rubido, shut his mind out in fear of Udu going out of control. Albedo consequently felt that he had been betrayed and abandoned by his other half, his own brother. His obsessive manner when dealing with Junior was a result of the psychological shock he had received at that time. I've always wondered when they were separated, because we never see them together, but 
I don't think they ever go over that. His half-mad personality was the result of Udu contamination, but even before that incident, he was unable to understand the fear of injury or death experienced by others due to his immortal condition. Perhaps as a reaction to this, he developed an acute fear of rejection and solitude, and was pathologically obsessed with forming relationships with others. After the Milshin conflict, he was found lying unconscious under the central shaft of the Song of Nephilim by Sellers, who had attempted to escape from Milsha by forcing the song to surface. I don't remember that, but I don't like the sound of that Sellers guy. At this time, Albedo was half dead, presumably as a result of being hit by waveforms, which had been released by Negredo. The URTV's failsafe and acting executioner. That also doesn't sound good. Once he finally recovered from the attack of his would-be executioner, Albedo turned to the UTIC organization and Ormus. He joined forces with Margulis and Sellers to obtain the Y data which Joachim Mizrahi had left. Although, Albedo's true objective was a complete link with Udu, which is the only possible way of granting his desire for oblivion. Together with Margulis, he doggedly pursued Momo, Mizrahi's final creation, in order to revive the Zohar that slept on Milsha. His unnatural fixation on Momo was the result not only of his desire to seize the Y data, but also of the relationship shared between Junior and the girl on whom Momo had been modeled, Sakura Mizrahi. Sakura and Junior's friendly behavior caused Albedo to feel lonely and excluded, eventually leading him to enviously wonder how he might interact with others in the same fashion. However, being unable to understand others' pain and consequently unable to touch their hearts, he could only express his emotions in a twisted manner. His seemingly cruel behavior towards not only Momo, but the Kirschwashers as well, was another warped reflection of his envious feelings towards such unity and emotional communion. Having obtained the Y data, revived Milsha, and finally linked again with Udu, Albedo was assimilated into Udu becoming one with its waveforms and awaited oblivion at the hands of Junior's anti-waveforms. While Obito's true desire was unity with Junior, his choice of death was the only means of escaping from the impossibility of that reality, motivated by the thought that if unity is impossible, oblivion is the next best thing. He achieved oblivion at Junior's hands by accepting Udu's characteristics into a part of himself. In his mind, this must have been the best way to get close to Junior. His choice to rely on Junior, even though he could have used his URTV ability to cause a mutual annihilation effect with Udu on his own, is further proof, proof of this notion. While oblivion did grant a portion of his wish, it was also undeniably an effort to escape the reality he faced. Once again, we killed him, yes? You're kind of ambiguous on that, aren't you, game? Next up we have... Hold on, I know this one. This is Alan Ridgely, former vice chief of Vector Industries, first R&D divisions, Cosmos Project, Joint Operation Systems Development. Once again, that's one hell of a title. Joined Vector's first R&D division in TC4764 after graduating from the University of Bormio. Once again, I think that's the only university they mention. While two years older than former chief Shion Uzuki, he is one year her junior at Vector. Acting as vice chief for the duration of Shion's time at Vector, he continually supported Shion and garnered her trust and that of his subordinates with his diligent work ethic. The term simple and honest describe this affable young man perfectly. Simple mean like stupid? He was appointed R&D chief after Xion's departure from Vector and was sent to 5th Jerusalem. He cares for Xion, but due to past events concerning Xion and her former love Kevin Winnicott and his own personal insecurities regarding Kevin, he does not often express his thoughts and emotions. Not to Xion. His family appears to be quite wealthy, but he prefers to avoid relying on them. His hobby is fishing. Wait, Alan comes for money? Xion, what the hell are you doing? Next up, we do have Wilhelm. Wilhelm is the founder and CEO of interplanetary conglomerate Vector Industries. Wait, founder? 
how old is he? Having created the UMN, a giant network unifying all of space and built facilities for hyperspace navigation, the company has become the de facto nucleus of all civilization with a firm grasp on all the latest technology. So he built the UMN. So Xion was wrong? Database, are you contradicting Xion here? Once the Galaxy Federation Executive Committee Director, his origins and personal history are shrouded in mystery. Furthermore, in addition to his official role, role he commands the secret order of cloaked figures known as Testaments, attempting to meddle with the destinies of Xion, Cosmos, and the others. The only ones who understand Wilhelm's fixation with Xion and Cosmos, his purpose and motivation, are the Testaments. Even, and even they may not truly understand his plans. Sorry, I think I messed that sentence up a little bit. Supposedly, his office is constantly filled with the music of Wagner. Not supposedly, every time we go to him, he's, he's blasting Wagner. Calling chaos a name, <laughs> Yeshua, and reading the movements of the compass of, of order and chaos, he plots to change the very shape of the world. How come one chaos is capitalized and the other isn't? Moving on, now we have Voyager. This is one of the Testaments. A follower of Wilhelm, he appears before Xion and the others several times as a Testament. It's kind of hard to see what color he is from there. He is thought to share some connection with Ziggy. If you uh, played or read uh, Xenosaga Pied Piper, you would know. You would know. Uh, I'm kind of surprised that they still make it a little ambiguous here, but what they reveal later in the plot kind of implies that you should have a knowledge of Xeosaga Pied Piper, so why they're ambiguous here, I'm not entirely sure. Next up, we have Testament Blue, a blue-cloaked follower of Wilhelm. He appears before Xion and the others several times as a testament. Louis Virgil's testament form. See, Louis Virgil. This is Virgil. The blue one is Virgil. Once again, I'm not sure why they're kind of being coy about it in the cutscenes. We know it's Virgil. Next up, we have the Red Testament. This one we do not know the identity of. A red-cloaked follower of w Wilhelm, he constantly monitors Xion and Cosmos as a testament under Wilhelm's direct orders. Uh, so, red, blue, I'm going to go with Voyager being the black one. Black, yeah, there you go. A black cloaked follower of Wilhelm. He appears before Xion and the other several times as a testament. Ziggy calling him Voyager suggests that the two shared some connection in the past. Once again, Xenosaga Pied Piper. Then we have the White Testament. This one was new at the end of the game. A white cloaked follower of Wilhelm. Or end of uh, Xenosaga Episode 2. I should say the last game. He was made a testament by Wilhelm after the space-time anomaly in Milshin Space. The details surrounding this are unknown. Next up, we have Guinan Kukai, Negredo, representative trustee of the Galaxy Federation Milshin Autonomous State Special Foundation, the Kukai Foundation. Like Junior, he is a survivor of the URTV U U Udu retrovirus force that was created to combat Udu. Named for the alchemical process of blackening, as put forth in C.G. Young Psychology and Alchemy, URTV Unit Number 669 variant, possessing the name Negredo, Pitch Black. Uh, for the record, the alchemical processes that they're talking about are to create the Philosopher's Stone. Uh, so, immortality, apparently. Presently hiding his identity as a URTV, he fills the role of representative trustee for the Kukai Foundation along with Junior, black-haired and uh, with dark green eyes. Calm in personality, he shoulders the trust and expectations of the Foundation members and holds powerful political influence. He was lauded for his defense and unification of victims prior to the enactment of the Species Preservation Act. He possesses the power to control the thoughts of others and the power of hypnotic suggestion, interference with a person's consciousness, using his voice as a medium. I don't remember this happening, but uh, I will trust you, game. If Junior is the practical controlling force behind the Kukai Foundation's activities, it can be said that Guinan is the political force. It is through the combined efforts of them both that the Kukai Foundation's continued existence is made possible. Without either, it would fail. 
Taken in by Helmer after the Milshin conflict, Guinan inherited the name of Z Zozi. I'm going to go with Zozi. Zozi Kukai upon establishment of the foundation. Incidentally, Zozi Kukai is the name of a fictitious industrialist invented by the second Milshin government in order to pool special activities capital. So he took the name of a fictitious character. Unlike the other URTVs, Guinan was not programmed to react to Udu's waveform. His true role was to act as a failsafe in the event that a powerful variant went berserk, specifically the elimination of Junior. So the whole purpose of Guinan as a variant was to kill Junior. Furthermore, Dmitry Yuryev planned to extend his own life by transplanting his psyche into Guinan due to Guinan's special powers. After his body was taken over by Dmitry, which happened last game, if you remember, Guinan was forced to work towards Dmitry's goals, regardless of his own will. Once again, not brought up, as far as I remember, in the summary, but very important. Guinan has been taken over by Dmitry. Next up, we have Kanan, who we already saw. Now we have Chaos. They're not going to give us as much information as we want here, yet again. A slight boy with an expression perpetually brimming with sorrow. I, I didn't notice that. And a far-sighted and philosophical manner of speech, distinguished by his transparent eyes and silver hair. His blue eyes, you can clearly see them there. Transparent would make them red. As he refuses to mention anything of his past beyond his name, his personal history and even the question of whether he remembers it himself are shrouded in mystery. I have a feeling he remembers it, he just doesn't want to talk about it. It seems as though he has spent a great deal of time with Captain Matthews and his crew and has earned their trust. Yeah, we figured that one out a while ago. Next up, we have Kevin Winnicott, central figure to the Cosmos Project joint operation, Shion Superior, and former lover. A man of great brilliance with a bright future ahead of him until he was killed protecting Xion during an accident in which the archetype, uh, Cosmos's archetype, went berserk during an activation test. After his death, Xion continued his work, taking the development of Cosmos into her own hands. Though generally a gentle young man who inspired trust in his subordinate, his expression was occasionally darkly clouded. Next up, we have the archetype of Cosmos. In Jungian psychology, which is very important to this game and I should know more about, the archetype is the portion of the mind which is passed on hereditarily. So in other words, it's the part of your personality and your mind that is passed on to you due to genetics, your archetype. It is said to be the model upon which the unconscious, un instinctive workings of the mind are structured. In the story, the name given to the prototype of Cosmos designed by Kevin. That ended up killing him. Next up, we have the test type of Cosmos. The frame put together by Xion and the others after transplanting the core module of the partially destroyed archetype into a spare frame. Christened Cosmos version 1. Partially, in order to shake off memories of the incident when the archetype went out of control, the exterior of this model's design was much closer to that of a human body. A damn nice human body. Several monitoring sensors were installed inside the body to record real-world data. And also to wear bikinis. 